Coming up next on This Week in Computer Hardware, our AMD's Radeon HD 7770 and 7750, the best new bargain GPUs. Is Intel delaying Ivy Bridge again? Is Apple quashing Ultrabook manufacturers a great home theater PC motherboard and the best feature in Intel's 520 SSD? It's all coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. Bandwidth for Twitch is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 157, recorded February 16th, 2012. Ivy Bridge is anti consumer. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly. All stream directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com slash twit. Welcome to Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware. I'm Patrick Norton, joined as always by the benchmarking man himself, who is actually happily located at home, Mr. Ryan Shrout. How are you doing, man? I'm doing pretty good. Uh, we have an interesting project that we're working on here. Uh, we've been talking about before removing offices and that kind of stuff, but we don't. Our, our fiber internet's not going to be in until the end of March. And we don't want to sign a new contract with like cable or the phone company or something like that to get internet. So we're, I think tomorrow we're going to test the length limits of Ethernet runs. Uh, they're they're longer than you think. Um. <laughs> we're looking at about 320 feet. Well, uh, worst case scenario, I'm trying to think. I've done, I've done at least 100 meters. Gosh. Yeah. What's, we're we're, we're right the, at the 100 meter uh, kind of limit there. So we're going to see. I'm going to go buy a spool of cable and, you know, see what we get. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it's always it really frightening. Which is like, we'll, we'll see what all the people also- in the other buildings, when they look out their windows and they see me uh, pulling a blue Ethernet cable across the ground through the woods, more or less. Uh, <laughs> See how that works out. If you want to drop down to 10 megabits per second, you should be good for 500 meters. That's fine. That's, this. I don't, the, the issue is we don't want to, I mean, we're talking about an internet connection. So if we can get 10 megabits, that's more than enough. So uh, I, I, I'm fairly confident we'll get it to work as long as nobody comes and cuts the grass in the next six weeks, which should be fine here. <laughs> Sorry, I'm envisioning like this cable, like going from like building to building, house to that's house. That's what it's doing. Yeah. 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 You, know, you can do it. Yeah. You can do a wireless bridge if you're feeling really crazy. Oh, I don't feel like spending that much money. I can get a spool of cable for 50 bucks. <laughs> that's a thousand feet. And, uh, you know, make sure I try that first. But we looked up some kind of <clears throat> the uh, the high powered uh, directional antennas and that kind of stuff. And they're about a hundred oh, bucks. I got a, I got a box bucks. of them. <laughs> you see, I can, I can nice. loan you like two 14 DVI directional antennas. <laughs> You'd be shocked. <laughs> I, be I, went through, I went through a, a Wi-Fi hacking phase and... and and I couldn't get it across the bay because we had some aiming issues. But a mile, three miles, we're good. Yeah, I'm talking 100 yards, maybe maybe 110. I can nail that, dude. <laughs> All right, we'll talk AMD. after the show then. That sounds interesting. <laughs> AMD Radeon HD 7770 and the 7750 Cape Verde GPU preview. Shiny new boards not fully tested, sir? Uh, no, these are fully tested. They are. Okay. Um, of course, it's a... It's a week where we have a show, so there has to be a graphics card launch. Um, <laughs> that's kind of kind of the rule. It's Thursday. There's a new GPU somewhere, right? <laughs> exactly. So the, the Cape Verde GPU is based on the same architecture as the 7970 and 7950 that we talked about uh, back in January. Uh, same Southern Islands architecture, only this is a much smaller version. This is the $159 and $109 parts. Um, you can see the $159 part that I'm showing, holding up here is kind of, it looks like a mainstream graphics card. Um, mm-hmm. It's not huge. It doesn't have, uh, it's only got a single power connector on it. Uh, it still has, it's because of the AMD connectivity options, it's still got great connectivity, dual link DVI, HDMI, two display ports. Um, it runs very power efficient. Um, it's a $159 card. Uh, the problem for this particular card is that there's a lot of competition in this sub $200 graphics card market. Um, mm-hmm. These, even from AMD and NVIDIA, uh, uh, AMD themselves rather, and NVIDIA. NVIDIA has the GTX 560, which is about $30 more than this, and they have the GTX 550, which is about $30 less than this. 
and the performance is about 20% lower for the lower cost card and higher for the higher price card, kind of as, uh, as you might expect. Um, and, you know, so that, that kind of scales where you, you think it should. The unfortunate part is, is we kind of had hoped that with this new architecture, new brand new GPU, mm-hmm. that they would be able to improve on the performance per dollar metric. But they aren't really right. improving on it. They're just kind of putting it in a spot. And compared to their own product line, they're actually behind in performance per dollar because the Radeon HD 6850, which is, you know, last generation's architecture, costs the same but performs a little bit better. So That's not so good. It's not so good. So, you know, AMD's kind of answer is, hey, well, BART's is end of life. They're not going to be in the market for very much longer. Mm-hmm. I understand that. And when BART's is gone, which is the, sorry, the code name for the 6800 cards, when that GPU is gone, the 7770 will be the best card from AMD in this price market. But we talk about, you know, we write reviews and we talk about, we, we have the show every week, so we get to update every week. Today, it's not the best card for your money, even if you're an AMD fan, even if you want to stick in the AMD ecosystem. Now, the, right. the other card I think is more interesting, which you might not believe this for me because I tend to be the high-performance <laughs> guy, the 7750. This one, so this this little guy, you know, it doesn't even have a, a, a complete heatsink shroud or anything like that. It uh, is a single slot design. It still has support for three outputs. Actually, has support for six technically, but those display port hubs have never really come to fruition yet. <laughs> uh, but what you'll notice here is that if you look at the card, there's no external power connection. It runs purely off the PCI Express bus. No external power. Also, no crossfire connection, which is kind of a kind of a letdown there. Um, but this is a hundred nine dollar card. It won't surprise me if in a month you can find this for ninety nine bucks, uh, you know, with rebates or whatever. Do you think they do you think they killed the crossfire connection on that just to prevent people from going, geez, I can double the performance of this car and 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 beat a seventy seven hundred or or one of the slightly higher cards for two hundred dollars and and running crossfire? Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's yes, and and the, you'll <laughs> notice actually um, when you look at this one. Uh, the 7770, it has a single crossfire connector. The previous generation right. seven uh, or 6700 cards had two. So you could run three and four GPUs in a single system. With this one, you can run only two. What's interesting about that is you're exactly correct. The reason they don't like to do that is because there's this kind of value discrepancy in the GPU market now where right. the 250 and below market is very competitive. So people are lowering, lowering prices and that kind of stuff. Whereas if you look at the $250 and above market, there's not a lot of competition and the graphics cards are spread out. Mm-hmm. So my guess is that if you had three of these 7770s, you'd be able to, you know, you're talking about $360 with the video cards that you might have the performance of a $450 card very easily. And so one of the right. ways they're trying to prevent that is by kind of removing that, that feature. <laughs> and the same thing is probably the case here. But even still, right. this card, the 7750, uh, uses only 55 watts of power under load, and it was able to play almost every game at 1080p with like our standard benchmark suite of settings. The only game that had a little problem with was Battlefield 3, as you might expect. We were able to run um, 1080p at medium quality settings over 40 frames per second, I believe, on this little card, uh, mm-hmm. which is really impressive. And it doesn't require external power. It's by far the most power efficient GPU. We have. I think it actually uses like half the power of the GTX 550 Ti uh, to get a similar level of performance, and it costs about thirty dollars less as well. So this card is a much better example of what the new architecture can do in terms of advancing price per dollar and price per watt, or I'm sorry, performance per dollar and performance per watt, um, mm-hmm. than I think the 7770 is, which is a little bit kind of odd because the 5770 from AMD two generations ago is still the most popular card on the Steam hardware survey. It's the most popular DX11 card on, on there. That was a, a wildly popular card. Um, and we were kind of hoping the 7770 was going to be, you know, that same thing where it was a great performance and pricing segment, uh, but it didn't really make the jump we were hoping for. <laughs> Overall, it's, the- it's an impressive thing. It's an impressive kind of sweet family of products. So it sounds like the 7750 might be the ultimate kind of home theater card as long as you don't want to play some of the more high-end games or yeah. newer games. 7770 yeah, I mean, you can play Skyrim likes- on it. You can play Battlefield on it. Battlefield 3 at medium quality settings 
is still pretty nice to play, right? And uh, we're not talking about running 25 frames per second or anything like that. It was able to run at, uh, at, at really good frame rates. And uh, for home theater PC, the only, the only kind of negative to it, because it is a uh, single slot design, you run uh-huh. into this issue where the heat sinks aren't as big, the fans aren't as big, they have to spin faster because of that to cool the GPU. And so this card is actually louder than this card. I have <laughs> pretty noticeable margin, um, which is kind of a letdown, but um, it's, that's the case. The other thing I will mention is the 7770 is the first GPU to ship with a 1 gigahertz uh, reference clock speed, which AMD is right. trying to make a big marketing deal of. I don't think it's that big a deal. Clock, we, we, we've, we've gone over this for years. Clock speed doesn't really matter. It's all about the mm-hmm. performance. But it is interesting to note at the very least. And we did get, uh, we got a couple of retail ones. This XFX unit is clocked at uh, 1120 megahertz out of the box. Right. So, I mean, that's a pretty hefty clock speed bump for, uh, for such a small GPU. So, it's, it's interesting. In, in this price range, it's um, really uh, uh, kind of an interesting shift to see. <laughs> It's funny always watching stuff in that hundred dollar, fifty to hundred dollar price range start to move around. It's kind of funny. Um, a lot of keyboard action going on. Uh, people, at Rosewell, the the uh, the uh, house brand for Newegg, came up with uh, you know mechanical cherry switch uh, based keyboards. Yep. There's been a lot of you know people talking about that. A bunch of friends of mine have been buying them. And uh, now we're going to talk about a keyboard dock. <laughs> A, a, a product category I thought was completely and utterly dead, um, but it's not exactly the keyboard dock you would think it is. It's the uh, Asus Transformer Prime, the TF201, and basically this is the one with the really slick pop-out uh, uh, keyboard adapter. Not the one we saw at um, not the one we saw at CES, but no, another is, product. Um, this is this is the same thing actually. Okay. Uh, oh, this, it is. this is the add-on dock to the Asus Transformer Prime. Sorry, I'm thinking of uh, we saw one of the uh, one of the ultrabooks we saw at, at uh, CES. Uh, or one of the ultrabooks I saw at CES actually had sort of you, you pressed a button and the the ports kind of ratcheted down from the back of it. And this is uh, actually okay. so this is actually a plug in dock for one of the e-pads from Asus. Right, 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 right. Okay. So uh, at, actually at uh, Twitch uh, at CES we showed um, I think this this exact same unit, the Transformer Prime and Integra Three processor. Uh, with the keyboard dock, we played some games and stuff on it. We had already posted a review. Matt Smith, who does our mobility stuff, did a review of the of the tablet itself. We hadn't had the keyboard uh, peripheral in yet, so we posted a review of that. And what was interesting, what I kind of what put it in here to discuss was, had, have you used the Transformer Prime with its keyboard attachment at all? I have uh, not. In, on any of the iterations? Okay, because one of the things... I kind of wanted some feedback on whether or not you thought a keyboard and touchpad addition to an Android tablet, even one running ice cream sandwich, would really make it a productivity device. Like, does adding a a keyboard dock to an iPad really make it a productivity device? Is it something you're interested in? Uh, Or do you think it's more of a... In some ways, I I I bought a Bluetooth keyboard... uh, pretty soon after I bought my first iPad because I, I touch type and I touch type fast, like 60, 80 words a minute. Um, mm-hmm. It's been a long time since I took a touch typing test, but um, it's, it's a huge, it's incredibly painful for me to try to sort of hunt and peck on that keyboard on the screen on any device, iPad, uh, Android or otherwise. Um, so for me, yeah, a, a Bluetooth keyboard makes a big difference. The docs, have been really frustrating from a lot of the a lot of the aftermarket docks have been really frustrating. A lot of the aftermarket keyboards have been really frustrating. Um, this one actually looks like it's a decent eighty eight percent plus keyboard with a standard layout, which is a huge deal for me because there's nothing worse than having somebody be like, "Yeah, we made this really stylish you know keyboard that goes with your insert whatever brand of, of tablet here, but it's unusable because they put like the delete key where the shift key is on most devices or something equally hideous." Uh, yeah. 
there's a really cool uh, uh, Apple sort of the sort of keyboard dock designed to charge your iPhone and then turns your iPhone into an extra touchpad, which was fantastic. But the way they jerked the keyboard layout, I couldn't actually um, use it because they ended up putting I want to say the backs one of the one of the major backspace keys or something where the delete key normally is, and it made the keyboard functionally unusable without a massive sort of rejiggering of how I I use my pinky <laughs> when I type. Um, yeah. So this is interesting. So the, the 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 dock in this case though the transformer prime not the I, I think people don't enjoy talking about random Bluetooth keyboard hell but um, so this actually has an extended battery right. um, acts as a full keyboard and it's interesting we're looking at the a pretty healthy like two hundred plus minute increase in performance um, if we're looking at the the peacekeeper battery test the YouTube streaming yep. Wi-Fi battery test. Uh, I think maybe even more dramatic, going from like to 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 thirty percent brightness. So you're you're four hundred fifty six hundred, like a th- again like a three hundred minute increase. That's that's a healthy increase in battery life, probably making it worth the uh, uh, worth the yeah. additional pain of it's, carrying it around. And, and and I actually like the form factor when it's attached better than without, right? Because without yeah. you, you worry about scratching the screen and that kind of stuff. It's kind of like the old adage of why. Some people like the flip phone stills because when you close it, it's locked. You don't have to worry about ruining any of the keys or the screen or any of the other kind of stuff. You get the same idea when, when the tablet and the dock are connected. It's, it's like a netbook. It's, it's like an ultrabook or whatever term you feel like using this week um, in, in form factor at least. So, right. Yeah. It's a good thing. It, it is. And it, it's not an exorbitant amount of money extra. I think it's like a $250 addition. Um, so it's not something you need right away, but uh, right. it's an interesting add-on for those types of devices. It will be interesting. So it's kind of funny, right, because the rumors iPad 3 are coming, maybe new Apple TV coming. Um, it's been funny to watch, uh, and, and you know, the, the next version of Android people are starting to talk about online. We've also been getting a lot of questions lately, uh, both at Techzilla, the, the main show I do, probably at PCPro.com and certainly on, on uh, Twitch about Ivy Bridge. And Ivy Bridge looks like it's being pushed again. What's going on with that? Or, sh- so, or should we... Do- oh, go ahead. Sorry. Well, yeah, we, we, can, we can talk about this one too. The, there are two kind of interesting stories going on, both of which I would consider anti-consumer uh, this one we're going to talk about is Intel delaying shipments of the Ivy Bridge processors. And here's why I consider it anti-consumer is because they're not really delaying it because they have a problem with the production or they have a problem with the, you know, the performance, they need to tweak anything or anything like that. The new rumor at Digitimes is that they are uh, going to delay Ivy Bridge. Um, they're go- well, they're going to release Ivy Bridge in early April, which right. has, has kind of been the plan. They're going to hold off on full shipments until after June because of all the inventory they still have with Sandy Bridge and all their vendors still have with Sandy Bridge platforms. Um, so, uh, you know, th- there's I-, I took the stance in this little story that this is this is kind of what happens when there's no major competitor. Right. right. A- AMD has some competitive parts with Lano in the in the mobile market. But if you look at Ivy Bridge. It's going to dominate the market. We know it's going to dominate the market in the desktop and in the mobile side. There's no reason for them to hurry this out the door necessarily. They could have it ready and, and hold on to it for however length of time they wanted to do. Uh, and without that competition, they're able to, um, I'm trying to remember the wording I used in this, um, <laughs> they're, they're able to adjust their product schedule based on internal financial reasons rather than external consumer forces, which is basically me just trying to say, even though the consumer can use this performance and would like this, the advantages right. and power and battery life that it offers, Intel is not going to see any financial benefit to it. So they're not going to do it. Whereas if AMD were there with another product coming out in that quarter or the next quarter uh, that would rival what Ivy Bridge could do, they would be pushing hard to get that out the door and into as many people's hands as possible. Um, this this is of course when certain people are leaping to their keyboards and basically pointing out that you're a communist and you're against profits and you're against <laughs> you know capitalism in the American way. But but the the, the truth is as much as I like to tease uh, both of us uh, uh, about our obviously anti-capitalist leanings. By the way, if you've ever met Ryan Ryan in in real life, trust me, uh, we love the capitalism. <laughs> me especially because yes. I got to travel behind the Iron Curtain uh, before it fell. And let me tell you something. 
Diamondism sucks on every level, especially if you actually like gaming performance. But the uh, the uh, point I was getting to is that this this you know, Ryan's absolutely right. When you get to a position where one company has such a commanding lead uh, in its field, they can basically be like, yeah, you know, Ivy Bridge, not as impressive as we would have liked. And Sandy Bridge, we still got a bunch of stuff in the channel, so we're just going to sit on it. Um, and... You know, because it, it's it's not entirely to Intel's advantage for AMD to go away, right? Because if AMD goes away, then they are kind of the sole person in the market, and 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 somebody somewhere is going to sue them for that, right? Uh, not because it's necessarily yeah. necessary, but just because it's just it's just if there's not a major competitor, people get pissed. Um, um, but it's going to be interesting to watch because AMD has basically ceded the high ground, accepted that they're they've they've kind of moving in a different direction that they can't keep up with Intel's engineering. Just the the flat out raw, I think, amount of money Intel has to hurl in engineering. I don't think anybody can compete with at this point. Um, yep. And, and I think it's I, th I don't think it's going to be you know we've been in a position where Intel basically had weak competition in the past, and yeah, you know it, it kind of sucks to be buying computers at that. The flip side, though, is that you're getting such a ridiculous amount of performance for your money at this point. Um, it's kind of hard to it's kind of hard to get too upset about it. Like I, I, I'd like to be, you know, we had somebody asking on Techzilla about, you know, should I get a, should I wait for Ivy Bridge? I'm like, eh, you know what I mean? I'm, I'm not seeing it. Like, great, you're going to pay more for a motherboard, and oh yeah, there's not a really huge performance over jump over Sandy Bridge. Like we've been spoiled for the last couple iterations of processors. Um, or at least it definitely. feels that, that way. That's definitely the case. No, I mean, that's definitely the case. I'm just of that mindset of progress will eventually slow down to where we, we don't yes. have the progress that we need, right? And I and I am always trying to prevent that in whatever <laughs> way I can. So if this little jab helps at all. Because if you look, I mean, if you look at that, uh, the roadmap that's posted with that story, actually, you look mm -hmm. at the very top line, the extreme section, actually the top of the extreme and of premium performance, that's Sandy Bridge E. That's a product that launched... Um, <laughs> earlier in the year, and it is unchanged throughout all right. of 2012. Why is that? That's because the AMD high-performance processor is gone, all right? It's never coming back, right. and Intel has the best-performing part, and they're going to have the best-performing part, and there's no reason other than... Uh, there's no reason for them to do that. I mean, <laughs> if they're going to continue to sell it, they'll just continue to sell it as it is. Um, you know, and, and there needs to be... As, if there's one thing that Apple has proven and all these other, you know, these companies have proven that when somebody is there to, 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 to push people in a certain direction, there will be change in that way. But um, what, what is also of kind of... when being pushed. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> this, this is another story that's kind of... It's, this one's more anti-consumer than the previous one. The rumor, another rumor... I don't think this is rumor. anti... Okay, don't I, think I don't so? think this is particularly anti-consumer. Uh, I think this is particularly this is kind of brutal so um asus tech one of the many companies uh making ultra books uh, pegatron technology um oddly enough which is a company that was spun off from asus tech's been manufacturing asus tech's ultra books uh, or asus right um um is going to stop manufacturing ultra books uh, because they picked up a apple contract and apple's like well, we don't really want you making the uh the these ultra books if you want the long dollar from the big apple and the capital infrastructure investment and the huge amount of supplies um yeah you you you're not going to be making ultra books for for a pc manufacturer so here's the thought so you know um adrian kingsley hughes at ZDNet says this is bs this is this is not legit this is not a legit story um you know one of the arguments that uh at, at scott makes a pc per is that you know look at all the crap that apple's you know apple's tree you know apple's fighting with samsung hdc google um they've been they're obviously divesting away and it feels like they're they're moving away from foxconn while they're while they're on one hand and it's a story something we probably should talk about is is uh uh, Apple's basically hired an independent agency to investigate uh, right. conditions at the manufacturers in China. And one of the initial reports is from the – this kind of like – this didn't fill me with a lot of sort of um, – What's the word I'm looking for here? I, I would, you know, when when the, the 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 president of the organization that's been brought in to investigate worker condition goes basically like, gosh. 
this sucks so much less than garment <laughs> factories where it's loud and there's big machines and there's, you know, bits of fabric and stuff. This is really zen-like. And, and, you know, I think monotony and boredom are the big challenges here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it, it's... it's uh, you know, it's it's hard to get a job in mainland China, and people are are scrapping really hard for them. Um, but That's, it's, go ahead. I was just gonna say, the the thing on this story is, uh, this the what particularly gets me here is you could you could see this in a, in a less negative way if 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 Asus right. went to these guys and said, hey, uh, we want you to make our iPads, but we're gonna need all of your capacity, and we're gonna outbid what Asus is paying for your, your manufacturing capacity. And that's right. maybe how it happened, that it's being construed <laughs> differently, um, you know, because Apple tends to be the, the, uh, a good target for negative press from, from PC-based media. But the mm -hmm. idea that uh, you said that the ZDNet author here says that Apple cannot push its weight against manufacturing and design companies and risk burning bridges is absolutely false. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's, it is. It is absolutely false. I mean, yeah. it is. No, I'm, I'm not, I'm I, just, I know. I'm, I know I'm, from so many people that have talked about SOC designs and, and panel panel manufacturers and that kind of stuff, where they very much do pull their weight around and say, "Hey, we're the largest buyer of flash memory." Right. Uh, what are you gonna do for me? You know that kind of stuff. It's. I mean, whether or not they did it in this case or to what degree is debatable, and we'll probably never know, but this kind of stuff does happen. But, and, it's, and it's part of business, right? And it's, it's it is. you know, we, you know, maybe Apple just said, we would like to make sure that we're your most important partner because we're going to make you a lot of money. <laughs> uh, and and that's, that's, that's the way business has been run for ever. <laughs> um, yeah. It's funny, uh, and it, it, while we're talking about Apple, uh, first of all, do you, do you want to talk about the the Nvidia reports that came out? Because it, it's um, it, there's there's not a whole lot uh, there necessarily. They made okay. they actually did a little bit better this year than last year. Uh, and depending on which analyst you talk to, you'll either see a positive outlook or a negative outlook. Uh, like Nvidia blames that their GPU shipments decreased on the hard drive shortage, but if you look at AMD's GPU shipments, they actually went up year over year, that kind of stuff. So it kind of looks like maybe uh, NVIDIA is making excuses on some of those fronts. Um, they talked about Tegra 2 orders had having a sharp decline, but they said that was because so many vendors were preparing for Tegra 3 and they weren't going to buy more of the Tegra 2. So you, depending on which um, camp you necessarily want to stand in, it would be very easy to construe all this information one direction or the other. I think uh, what we learned in 2011 is that not a lot has changed, but 2012 looks like it will be very important for them financially one way or the other because of the declines in discrete and the increases in the SOC market and how much of that percentage they can actually capitalize capitalize on. I think they're out of they're out of quarters where they're allowed to say we are going to have design wins and they are going to be awesome. When you're on your third generation of chip, you have to put up or shut up at this point and uh, we will know we'll know this year for sure. Speaking of uh, this year, Tim Cook is first major kind of well not his first major but tim cook basically doing his, his analyst briefing this week uh uh article we found up at uh a simco which i never heard of before but it's the, the title is incredibly compelling apple sold more ios devices in 2011 than all the macs it sold uh sold in 28 years and tim cook um the transcription from the the goldman Sachs uh goldman Sachs briefing um 55 million iPads sold to date. This 55 is something no one would have guessed, including us. To put it in context, it took us 22 years to sell 55 million Macs. It took us about five years to sell 22 million iPods. It took us about three years to sell that many iPhones. And so the thing is, the iPad is on a trajectory that is off the chart. Um, and it's kind of crazy when you realize, you know, it, there's... Uh, <laughs> uh, you look at this, and it's like years after launch. So, twenty-eight years after the Mac is launched, they've sold about one hundred twenty-five million Macs, and they've sold like one hundred seventy-five million iPhones. Yep. Probably, four, I guess, four years now after the iPhone was launched, and the iPad is, you know, in, in less than two years, is is fifty-five million units sold. So, it's incredible to look at the adoption rate on some of Do these we devices. Does this explain why Mountain Lion was previewed today and 
more and more of the operating system is becoming iOS like. I mean, um, they obviously, they're obviously saying, "Look, people like this. They like to take. It, they like to use this. They're comfortable with it. Uh, it just makes sense at this point." I don't know. It'll be interesting to see the one of the one of the some of the scuttlebutt. Go, and you know, you, you got to take any Apple rumor mongering with a gigantic salt lick of salt. That's just a grain. But um, you know, you think about what. Intel's pushing in terms of advancing the interface on the on the PC notebook. We want touch screens. We want voice recognition. Um, a lot of people are saying that the next generation of the MacBook Pro is going to be you know serious. There's going to be a serious jump on the next you know round of MacBooks. And you know, is that going to be a touch screen? Is that going to be Siri? Is Siri going to be integrated into OS 10? Um, you know, I'm a little. You know, I'm not really excited about software updated being integrated in the Mac App Store. Um, you know, it's, 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 you know, Apple confirmed, like in an article on ZDNet, Apple confirmed to ZDNet this evening that it is streamlining third party additions and software updates along with operating system releases into the Mac App Store. Um, you know, which makes me wonder at, you know, how long is it going to be before Apple manages or, or forces the, uh, uh, forces the Mac operating system, you know, OS 10 to be as tightly controlled as, pardon me while I, I put the uh, link in here so that uh, Chad and everybody has it, you know, how long it's going to be before they manage to lock down the operating system and the ability to install applications on it or at the ability to extract revenue from the applications as tightly as they have in OS 10. Um, or excuse me, as tightly as they have in, uh, in, in the iOS. I, you know, I'm, I'm not, you know, it's, you know, you know, it certainly it sucks as a business user, user to deal with some of what's going on with OS 10 and tying OS 10. Yeah. It's like, oh, you're going you're gonna to need your, your user ID. And it's like, well, crap, man. I've, you know, we've got like 40 Mac notebooks in the office and every single Mac notebook that's running the latest version of the operating system. And, and then with the next version of the operating system, it sounds like they're going to be locked into using you know, the user ID. And that's a nightmare when you're dealing with, you know, people coming to a company, leaving a company, you know, managing it. Uh, and at Apple, it's obvious that Apple doesn't really care about the enterprise market, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not entirely sure what they're doing. You know what I mean? Like, you know what I mean? It's like, okay, built-in Twitter integration, hooks to Apple TV, um, iMessage, yeah. reminders, notes, iChat. I'm just not really sure... You know, uh, I'm just not really sure where they're going with Mountain Lion. I don't get it, man. It just doesn't seem like a... I agree. Uh, eh. You know, it's just like, wow, it's like I'm going to start, you know, being really happy about spending more quality time with the PC where an operating system acts like an operating system and then it's, oh, crap, look at Windows 8. <laughs> you know, yeah. We're going to be the old curmudgeon people very soon. Uh, I think we already are. Well, I am. Yeah. Um, you put another link in here for the ASRock review over to Nantech ah. ASRock Core HT Server Edition review. I had not seen this I yet. Thought, this looks pretty impressive. It's an interesting box, right? So uh, uh, Nantech has, has done reviews of, uh, of uh, earlier Core HT box from ASRock. So it's uh, Sandy Bridge Core i5 2410 um, Intel HM67 chipset, uh, four gigs of DDR. Three, you know, Intel yep. HD graphics, and what's kind of funny about this one is they they dropped uh, two 500 gigabyte, 7200 RPM uh, Western Digital Scorpios. I want to say in, in RAID zero, um, huh. which is like kind of what's new about this particular uh, core HTPC. But it's an interesting. This is their mid range uh, home theater PC. So they've got the ASRock does uh, ion based machines at the low end, Vision 3D units at the high end. But this is kind of an interesting idea for a small home theater box uh, and just exactly how much you can stuff into a relatively small form factor on it's that all one. Using, or, um, it's all using notebook components. Yeah, absolutely. And that's usually yeah. when you find, when you get to a certain point, you can't really use desktop components anymore. Um, or maybe it just becomes, from a power standpoint, uh, the power consumption for the notebook components is, is a little more attractive than the power component, or basically the power consumption on, on desktop components. But Now, there's no, there's no discrete GPU in this at all, though, is there? No. Right, so and you know, I'm pretty yeah, sure there's so, not so, going to be for that. Yeah, so, but, for, so for gaming, it's not, 
it's not going to be a great like no, it's, it's going to be a hideous gaming thing. box. Yeah, but it's it's kind of funny for a for a home theater box, for a basic home theater box, or something you can use to serve media around the house. Um, uh, I think it's got potential. It's, it's just always interesting to me to see what people are doing with the super small formats. I mean, you know, not the cheapest uh, devices out there. I think you're looking at about five hundred dollars for this machine. Um, you know, but it's not. You know, unlike an Apple TV, it'll play Blu-ray. <laughs> It also uh, runs about 65 watts under full load. So that's pretty manageable. And it's got USB 3.0, HDMI yeah. audio pass through, THX Studio Pro, BGN Wi Fi. I think it could use a little uh, improves, improvements visually. It's not a very cool looking thing, I guess. Not a very sexy uh, you know, device, but. You know, and I, the nice thing about IR blasters, you can put the, you, you know, wireless yeah. HDMI is getting good and affordable. Actually, uh, Robert Heron on the last episode of uh, AC Nation and, and Texel did a roundup. And for $250, you can actually get a decent wireless HDMI product that also mm-hmm. acts as a switch and also acts as an IR blaster. You, so you can stuff everything in the closet. Um, and that's what I'm working on in my house is putting like the Blu-ray player, the receiver, and everything is hidden. And then an IR blaster allows me to run everything from basically I can point my yep. remote control on the screen and actually everything is behind me and in a locked room. <laughs> yep. That's so, good. Yeah, we're going to do some of that yeah. stuff at the new office too. It's exciting. Yeah. Let's take a moment to thank our friends over at Netflix. For we should absolutely do that before we get into our uh, emails for this week. We should let everybody know that this episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is, again, brought to you by our very good friends at Netflix. If you uh, haven't heard about the benefits of Netflix, the joys of using Netflix streaming, we're going to tell you about them again. Because this time, you're actually going to go to that URL of Netflix.com slash twit and sign up for their free 30 days of service. Now, Netflix is a streaming service, their streaming option you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a big benefit to people that are busy. Maybe they're just lazy, one or the other. We'll take whatever we can get. But it does save you time, money, and hassle. You don't have to worry about going to a rental store. You don't have to worry about going to a grocery store to any kind of box to pick up or deposit DVDs. Uh, you're, you're able to stream videos uh, or movies and TV shows instantly, thousands of, uh, of each. Um, you can watch them on your Mac or your PC which is maybe, maybe it's not the most comfortable thing for you, but you can watch them on your iPad or your iPhone or your Android phone if you're on the go. Uh, you can watch them on your TV if you have an Xbox 360 hooked up, a PlayStation 3, a Nintendo Wii. Maybe you have a Roku box or an Apple TV or something like that. Or if you have like one of those home theater PCs we were just talking about, you can run Netflix through that straight to a TV as well. So you can get Netflix almost anywhere uh, you are at. And uh, one of the cool features of Netflix is the kind of DVR functionality that allows you to begin watching a show in one place and finish it in another place all automatically. You don't have to worry about uh, trying to sync anything or anything like that. If you're, if you're in bed watching a, watching a movie, fall asleep, uh, you can pick right back up where you left off uh, on your way to work on the bus or something like that. Or while you're not paying attention at the morning meeting on your iPad or something like that. And all, you have all those types of options, which are great. If you travel for work, take your laptop with you. If you have an internet connection at the hotel room, you can watch Netflix. You don't have to worry about finding the local channels on whatever your hotel is. You can watch whatever TV shows they have available on Netflix streaming uh, anytime you want, which is great. And you can watch them as often as you want, as many times as you want. There's no limits. It's an unlimited plan there. Um, and the best part is you can try it out completely free for 30 days to make sure it's the service that you like. And I think you're definitely going to like it once you, once you, once you try it out. Netflix.com slash twit is the URL for that. If you don't like the service, you can cancel at any time. But I don't think you're going to have that issue. Um, you know, these are, this is great for families. This is good for individuals. This is great for couples um, that, that, that want to have access to a lot of media anywhere they go uh, nearly instantly. So Netflix.com slash twit. Be sure to use that URL when you sign up for the free trial. It helps us out. It helps you out. It helps, it helps everybody, let's be honest. We thank Netflix <laughs> for their support of This Week in Computer Hardware, the entire Foot Network, and uh, hope you enjoy watching instantly with Netflix streaming. Yay, Netflix. We should take a moment to do some viewer questions. Twitch at twit.tv is the email address if you want to ask Ryan and I a question, or you can tweet us at Patrick Norton or at Ryan Shrout. 
And yeah, Anthony I think is, actually, I was going to say, it is T-W-I-C-H at quit.tv. <laughs> I think maybe I'll have somebody set up a forwarding. So, because I saw a couple of emails come in in the last two weeks where they had sent it to twitch at twit.tv, um, and those tend to bounce back. So, we'll set up another forward so we catch those as well for people who aren't spelling correctly. And I'll work on my anyway, enunciation. Saw, yeah. <laughs> That's Twitch, not Twit. Shh. I've been doing a lot of standing out with my son as he's learning how to read. Uh, Anthony's got a question about the Intel 520 SSD. He says, I'm afraid that you missed the key feature of the Intel 520. Your panel seemed to suggest that people might be willing to pay the premium for the Intel brand name. There were compliments about the performance and use of the Sandforce controller. There were even some references to the perception of quality around the Intel brand. I can't disagree with these compliments. They are right on. The problem is the panel missed the key feature. They are worth the premium because they support a password lock with 256 bits AES data encryption. I'm the IT manager for a hospital. We have the obligation and the legal responsibility to protect personal patient information at all times. We generally try to keep it safely in the data center, but there are times when this just isn't practical. If we need to store information on laptop computers, we have to take extra precautions. In the past, we have used traditional spindle hard drives like those from Seagate that support full drive encryption. While this provided the security we needed, we missed out on the other benefits of traditional SSD drives such as high speed, low latency, and tolerance to shock. The Intel 25 Excuse me, the Intel 520 SSD gives me everything I need. That is why I ordered several of them within 10 minutes of reading about the performance and security <laughs> features. You know what? I look forward to finally being able to encrypt. What's funny is it's, it's the 250. You, you can encrypt a, a standard SSD. You just don't right. have hardware um, uh, acceleration for AES, which is it's what I'm assuming uh, the 520 SSD does. I should have looked that up before the show. Um, but it does. Uh, yes, that that is actually a giant bag of cool. And uh, on behalf of Ryan and I and, and Robert and anybody else, I will apologize for not mentioning it. Um, and, and I lust after this being able to do this on on my notebook just for the sheer unbridled uh, security coolness of of having all of your data locked down, and also uh, having read about some of the spectacular acts of stupidity involving personal information anthony uh on behalf of the entire twitch t-w-i-c-h at twit.tv audience <laughs> i'd like to thank you for being so hardcore about securing uh the personal information of the patients at your hospital i, I am actually the- getting a little bit of an update here from alan uh through our skype okay. chat here uh <laughs> where apparently this is not an intel exclusive feature though it is a sand force exclusive controller feature and as far as he knows um, they all have the capability to have that feature enabled. So the Vertex 3 would be uh, one of those um, such drives as well. And it uses the Sandforce 2200 series of controllers. So all Sandforce double encrypts on both ends of the pipeline, according to Alan. So it is not exclusive to the Intel 520, but it is not uh, all SSDs in the market. So if you're looking for Sandforce 2200 series, that may be uh, what he's looking for there. So... We weren't exactly, we weren't all the way wrong, Patrick. Just, <laughs> just forget to mention that. We, um, we have an email from Tony about a Battlefield 3 upgrade. He says he's looking to replace his current video card in his desktop. Right now, the most stressful game in his library is Mass Effect 1. And it looks great running on my 8800 GTS with a 10, uh, 1680 by 1050 monitor on high settings. He's looking to purchase Mass Effect 3 and Bioshock Infinite when they come out. But during the Battlefield Three public beta, my system was only able to push about 30 frames per second on medium settings. I would like to play my games at least at medium to medium high with a solid frame rate over 40 and imagine games coming out will be too demanding for my current card. My CPU is a Q6600 overclocked. I uh, don't want to place the whole system if possible. Can you recommend a video card in the 2 to 250 uh, or scrap the plan altogether? Um, so it's interesting. First, I'll note, if you pre-order Mass Effect 3 now, you can get Battlefield 3 free if you haven't purchased it already. So that's a good bonus for you there. Um, also interesting to note, he says he's playing Battlefield 3 on medium settings around 30 frames per second. Remember, this video card that I showed that is $109 <laughs> that requires no external power will run Battlefield 3 medium settings at 1080p at about 40 to 45 frames per second. So this would already be an upgrade. Now, if his budget is 200 to 250 bucks. I would recommend looking at uh, like a Radeon 6950 or a GeForce GTX 560 Ti 448. 
it's a lot of numbers and letters, but um, the GTX 560 Ti 448, which was a special edition that came out right before Christmas last year. Uh, and I believe those are still some available. And I, and I think the Q6600 overclocked to 3 gigahertz will be able to last a little bit. You might look at upgrading your 4 gigs of memory to 8 gigs since memory is so cheap at this point. Right. Maybe, uh, I guess this is probably running DDR2 instead of DDR3, so maybe it's not as cheap as I thought. Um, <laughs> but that puts it in perspective. The 8800 GTS, based on the G92 GPU, was, was at one point a fantastic video card. And now we have this that doesn't require any external power, uh, runs at 55 watts card for about $100 that outperforms it pretty easily. Oops. So, yeah, that's nice. And if you, get, if you get something like the GTX 448 or the GTX 560 Ti 448 uh, or the 6950, you'll have room to grow uh, with that as well. If you want to go up to a 1080p monitor or multiple 1080p monitors. So keep that in mind. <laughs> Multiple 1080p monitors of joy. Matt's got a question about a home theater PC build. He says, I've been wanting to build a media center PC for watching Hulu, Amazon Prime, and other streaming sites. I currently use diversity in my Xbox 360 for streaming 98% of my TV watching, which is an awesome way to do it. Xbox 360, an outstanding media device, uh, home theater uh, device. He says, I don't have access to sites like CBS, OPB, and other networks that are not on Hulu, Amazon, and Netflix. To get these shows, I drag my PC over to the TV and plug it in, which can be annoying. So I want to build a small media center just to handle my TV watching. I was looking at the Zotac NVIDIA Ion Mini ITX, but that looks to be getting old, and I was wondering if there is anything better mini, any better mini ITX style setup. And is the NVIDIA Ion chipset a good deal? I do plan to stream HD, and this will be this little board, will this little board be able to produce 1080p? I was thinking of getting a Google TV, but the browser is blocked by so many sites. Is there a better option in that hype? Um, <laughs> yeah, the, the Ion, I was going to say the the Atom Ion stuff is definitely getting a little long in the tooth. Um, you had a pretty good link on here uh, looking at uh, uh, the Fusion AMD devices, basically, which yeah. is the Fusion AMD, a, a motherboard uh, uh, CPU combo. Those are all around 100 to 140 bucks, I think, if you push it. Um, and that will definitely get you 1080p video, Blu-ray decoding, um, should you choose to put a Blu-ray uh, uh, player in the box. Um you know, it's, it's interesting. Uh, home theater PCs, uh, Robert's really frustrated um, looking at home theater PC builds right now. Uh, not so much because Windows 7 is fantastic. Uh, Windows Media Center is fantastic. Um, but while we've heard all of this hype about the interface on Windows 8, we haven't heard anything about what's going on with Media Center support. So, like, just about the time we get all of these really amazing cable card options that work with home theater PCs, um, you know, Windows seems to be like, yeah, Microsoft's like, you know what, screw it. We're walking away from CES. We're not going to talk about, you know, Windows Media Center um, in, in Windows 8, which uh, on some level doesn't really matter because, A, Windows 7 is still going to be running great for a while, for years now, and, and B, um, there's so many radical alterations in the interface of Windows 8. You know, everything else is, is kind of a minor sideshow at this point. But, um, yeah, I agree with you. The, the NVIDIA Ion stuff is getting a little long in the tooth. Um, uh, will it play 1080p? It should actually that should actually comfortably decode Blu-rays and stuff. But I I think Ryan, you're on the right track. Looking at the Mini ITX motherboards with the uh, Fusion AMD combo, these are going to be a little bit more power efficient as well. Uh, there's an ASUS E35M1i that is passively cooled as well, which would be a nice plus for a home theater PC. Um, MSI has a couple of really nice ones as well. Uh, they do have like kind of the smaller fans, which which can be a little bit troublesome in terms of noise. But the MSI E35 IA E45, uh, which is odd, E45 uses an E350 <laughs> PPU. But um, you know you're, you can find those for under 100 bucks after rebate, about 120 dollars before rebate, that type of thing. And it's got your CPU and your GPU and your motherboard all in one, and then you just add some memory uh, and add a power supply. You can also look for some of these. I don't know. If they have any of these that actually utilize the external power bricks instead of uh, in internal power supplies, which if you can find one of those would give you more flexibility in terms of what you can and it can what kind of cases you can put it in and stuff. I think I think all of these are actually using ATX power supplies, but um, hmm. for these you can even get. I actually have some here. I don't have them close enough for me to reach for them, but the ATX. 
power supplies that are then powered by an external power brick. Um, right. So it's got an ATX connection inside, and then you, uh, for the external connection, you would just have a plug on it. So th- those exist as well. And I think you can get those for like 30 bucks on Newegg and stuff like that too. Those are mm-hmm. little tips for home theater PC builds. <laughs> uh, let's do... This is an interesting question from Derek about multi-monitor power consumption. It says, uh, hi guys, like the show and could use some advice on my multi-monitor setup. I've been obsessed with power consumption ever since I got a UPS that monitors power usage. It's amazing what happens when you are suddenly consciously aware of uh, those types of so those types of data points. You got a Sapphire 6950 card and happy with the power consumption for single monitor, but when, I, when a second monitor is enabled, the power consumption close to doubles. I've monitored the CPU processes, and that does not change at all. So I assume the power, the additional power usage is coming from the GPU. This is not restricted to a second monitor that is connected to the GPU directly. I have an iPad and use the iDisplay as well as X Display, and when those monitors... Uh, are enabled, I get the same result. The power consumption of my system goes from 130 watts to 230 watts. I've read some discussions about this problem specifically related to the heat of the GPU. Uh, this is also a problem because I enjoy not having to hear my computer running by just enabling a second monitor. The noise of my system increases a lot. For these reasons, the GPU thinks need more power. What advice can you give me? Um, I have seen this before. I thought it had been a problem that had been solved, though. Uh, we saw this, I believe, with the like the GTX 590 at one point. So what mm-hmm. happens is uh, if you have, this is not a good, great example because it doesn't have two DVI ports on it, but if you had one monitor hooked up, he was saying he's getting 130 watts idle. Hook up another monitor, all of a sudden, you know, you're at a Windows desktop at idle and your power consumption jumps significantly. He's saying it going right. up to 230 watts. Um, what it, what would be, you could be 100% sure it's a GPU if, Download a little tool called GPU-Z, uh, GPU-Z, and it lets you monitor your GPU clock speed and memory speed and that kind of stuff. Uh, go open it up, look at the GPU clock speed with just one monitor connected, and then plug in a second monitor or enable a second monitor and see if that clock speed goes up. My guess is that you will see the clock speed go from something like 50 or 100 megahertz to something like 400 megahertz, um, which is kind of one of the intermittent intermediate P states for the GPU. That should be fixed in software. I would ask what version of the driver he's using, how recently he's updated his driver, mm-hmm. because as far as I know, these problems have been fixed on both AMD and NVIDIA architectures. It wasn't a hardware problem necessarily. Um, it was more something they could fix with vBIOS and uh, drivers. So depending on how old the 6950 is, um, if it's if it's returnable or RMAable, you may be able to contact uh, Sapphire and have them uh, return it, so you don't have to worry about trying to flash BIOS on that yourself, or just returning it and buying a different model that maybe will turn out to be newer as well. So I would, you can make sure it's a GPU by doing using that tool, the monitoring tool for the frequency there, and then uh, uh, check to make sure you're using the latest software. Twelve dot one is out. Twelve dot two is out in some form. Um, but if, is, if you're using anything like 11.12 or 11.11, it should be fixed because those have been, you know, the 16.50 is not brand new, a brand new product. If you're using a driver out of the box, for example, you might be having a problem. So <laughs> I would check that. It's always the little problems. Interesting question yeah. from Ben about touchscreen panels. So I have a question about my sanity in my next computer build. would like your opinion. Uh, we are not mental health professionals, but we'll do our best to be of assistance. Ben says, I work for a company that makes industrial touchscreen computers, Dynex Inc., but along that route, they make large format touchscreens as well, 32 to 70 inches. That's cool. We're getting in a new 32-inch panel that has 24-7 runtime rating, 1080p, LED, and from talking to my boss, it is a very good panel. He gets to test it today. So, Ben's question is, I want to get three of these that will run longer than anything that I can buy consumer grade and I know exactly how they are built for about 1200 or should I just go with three other panels? And yes, three is how many I read. PS, these will not have touch built into them. Also, is the next NVIDIA GPU Kepler supporting more than two outputs? Um, $1,200 is not a lot of money for three 32-inch panels. Um you know, that's that's probably, you know, if these are full-on industrial grade, have excellent color, 
um, you're super happy because you know how they've been built. That's awesome. Um, you know, they're, you know, because, uh, you know, before anybody in the audience is like, that's a fantastic deal. Remember, you know, a 32 inch um, 1080p monitor is essentially a, a television, an HCTV, right? And when you get to HCTVs, the prices are a lot lower because we're not looking at those super cool high end 25, 60 by 1600 resolutions. Right. So, you know, I'm like, hey, you know what? If you're getting a smoking deal on some industrial grade monitors, go for it. Um, Are you these touchscreen monitors? Is that I'm insinuating no. that they make in touch industrial touchscreen yeah. computers? Yes, these will not have touch built into them. Like like three ah, thirty you know, okay. three thirty two inch touchscreen, you know, panels. That would be an insane deal. Twelve you know four hundred yeah. bucks for a, a, a touchscreen would be an insane deal. Um, but a thirty, you know, a, a high end with, you know, if the color is good and you're you're looking at something the equivalent of a, a nice IPS monitor, yeah, I'd say go for it. Um, you know, thirty two inch panels, thirty two inch computer panels should be industrial computer panels should be built better than a thirty two inch HD TV. Um, color fidelity is always a question, but you're going to be able, to, you're going to know the the stuff that's available at your company. Um, I say, yeah, go for it, man. Um, <laughs> You know, if it was me, I would much rather have, you know, higher resolution 32 inch panels, because if you, if these are going to be in a situation where you're like, I am going to make my ultimate three panel flight simulator, um, yeah. you know, 32 inches is a little big for 1080p. If it's really close, if they're across the room, you know, if they're at the far end of the desk, um, 1080p, you know, because basically the, the problem with using because people are like, oh, you know, I'm going to get a 55 inch, you know, HDTV and use it as my desktop monitor because that's going to be super huge. And it's like, yeah, you know what else is super huge in a 55 inch monitor? You know, it's the same, you know, 1080p pixels. It's the same number of pixels, but as the monitor gets pick bigger, the pixels get bigger. And you don't notice that when it's 8, 12 feet across the room. You do notice it, you know, if you, you bring up the kill factor, you definitely notice it when it's like three feet away from you. You know, if you sit with your monitor at arm's length away, 42 inch flat panel that's 1080p the pixels are going to seem huge um it may yeah. bother you a lot <laughs> but uh that would that would be my only caveat it's 32 inch panels those pixels are pretty big and you know if if they're kind of closer than four feet you may start to really notice uh uh how big those pixels are but you know uh if if you're you know you, you're not going to spend 700 or 900 dollars to get a 27 inch you know WQXGA or, you know, 2560 by, by 16 something uh, monitor, then yeah, I'd, I'd say you may as well support your company, especially since you know how they're built and the specs they're built to. It's always nice to know that things are built better. Um, yes. I don't think Kepler is going to support more than two outputs, is it? Uh, Next gen it, GPUs? It, 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 it might. Yeah. It will. Let, let, me, let me just say this. Um, AMD has done it since the 5000 series, maybe the 4000 series. And if they don't support at least three outputs, they've done something really wrong. <laughs> they'll, it'll, it'll support more than two outputs. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Don't tell anybody I told you guys that, okay? <laughs> that's just an educated guess. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah, that's yeah, yeah, that's exactly what it is. I'll just say if they don't do it, they're crazy and they're going to get destroyed for it. Uh, when the <laughs> or at least so. mocked. Yeah. We've got probably time for one last question. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, email from Jay about Windows 8 and gaming. Hello, Ryan and Patrick. He has seen every screen every screensaver there was on TV with Patrick on it. Whoa. So there you go. That's a lot of television, big, dude. <laughs> big, big time fan. I have a general question about Windows. Thanks, I am a gamer and play games like Civ 5. Uh, I run Windows XP, an AMD processor, and it takes three minutes to load the game. <laughs> when I upgrade my computer to a new system, should I go Windows 7 or wait for Windows 8? Will Windows 8 be DX12 and which is better, AMD or Intel? So there's a lot of kind uh, of anecdotal questions here. Uh, well, if you, if you want the game to load faster, get an SSD <laughs> and install the game yeah. on the SSD. Um, because, so it doesn't really tell us what hardware he's running. It just says AMD. I mean, I, there's if he's on an AMD 486, that's obviously the problem. Um Windows 7 or Windows 8? What do you think, Patrick? I don't think... I, there's no reason to wait for Windows 8. No. Windows 8 is going to be... 
Yeah, Windows 8 is going to be like there's going to be a public preview in the relatively near future for Windows 8. But Windows 8, yeah. I, I, I don't worry about Windows 8. Windows 8, it's, it, it is, does bring DX11.1, right. uh, but it's a very, it's a very minor change, uh, and I, and I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't wait for that, especially since it's not going to be out until the end of this year, maybe type of thing, right? right. So uh, three minutes is a long time to load up a game of Civ 5. Windows 7 is the way to go still. Yeah, I would do that. <laughs> and then in terms of which is better, AMD or Intel, that's a loaded question. It all depends on what you want to spend. Um, I will, of course, recommend PCPer.com slash leaderboard as a terrific spot <laughs> to uh, begin your search for PC components on what you want to build and upgrade to. Obviously, it sounds like if it's a really old machine, you're kind of going to start from scratch anyway. So that gives you a good idea of what to go from there. AMD or Intel, you know, either one is going to work, honestly. Intel is the most popular choice right now. But if you buy an right. Intel FX 8150 or whatever, it's, they're, not, they're still not bad parts. And they're going to be way better than what you have today. Um, and then, like Patrick said, get an SSD if you want something to load faster. It's expensive in terms of cost per storage unit, right. cost per gigabyte. Uh, but they are the hot trend in PC and PCs and notebooks and everything. they're the hot trend in computing right now just because of of their extreme extremely awesome speed. So and if you you if you play that game a lot, you could save yourself an hour or two in sitting around a month. <laughs> you could save yourself hours and hours. How much, how much is your time worth? That's what you got to think. That's what you got to think. And it's kind of funny how it starts to it starts to add up. You know, it's just I I love my SSDs. <laughs> And with that, we're going to call it for this episode of Twitch, This Week in Computer Hardware. Every week, you may have noticed, we, we talk about the news and hardware. We answer viewer questions about hardware. We occasionally dip our toes into, you know, phones and, and, and mm. tablets. And we certainly love notebooks and talk about them a lot. We want your questions. Twitch, T-W-I-C-H, at twits.tv is the email address. At Ryan Shrout for Mr. Ryan. At Patrick Norton. Um, this, of course, would be the Twitter addresses for the two of us. What's coming up on PC Per this week, man? Uh, what do we have coming on PC Pro? We got more GPUs to test. We've got retail versions of a couple of new cards. We've got 7950s to test that are in and overclocked. Um, we are going to have, actually, I have this open right now. We're going to have a review of the Lenovo ThinkPad T420. And um, a couple. we've got a couple of interesting cases, micro ATX tower closures from Silverstone that we're going to take a look at. There's a lot of cool stuff coming up um, and a couple of things we can't, can't really tell you about. <laughs> a couple things that will involve Ryan being sued if he talks about them. Yeah. yeah. How about on uh, Techzilla? What do you guys got uh, coming up? We pre recorded Monday's episode because of, of President's Day being a holiday uh, right, and the studio right. being closed. So we, uh, we actually we kind of went nuts talking about emergency power supply. We had a viewer who was like, okay, I've got my three day, my bailout bag, but my big problem when the power goes out. Uh, and the power goes out a lot in the in the in the part of the country this man just moved to. Is how do I keep my cell phone running? Uh, how do I keep an iPad charged for the kids? We talk about sort of emergency power supplies for your technology. Um, how to resell your electronics and get decent money for them. And uh, uh, an interesting aside on uh, whether or not laptop cooling devices are worth the USB power. They suck. <laughs> <laughs> That is interesting. And, and, and we, we discuss in great detail my personal favorite notebook cooling device that won't cost you a single penny. At least if you have a desk in front of you. <laughs> so that's, that's what's coming up at techzilla.com. Nice. Week. Nice. We're excited. I think that's it for this edition of Twitch, This Week in Computer Hardware. I'm Patrick Dorn. I'm Ryan Schro. We'll see you next week on Twitch. Patrick, have you ever seen a Coca-Cola freestyle machine? No. I've never even heard of a Coca-Cola freestyle Neither machine. Neither had I until earlier this week. So I love Coca them. Oh, you, 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 They're you, great. you use them? They're the best. So, so they have Coke, Diet Coke, Coke Zero, uh, Sprite, and that kind of stuff, Fanta, and is all these like, drinks. Does it they, pack syrup inside of it? And then you can add whatever flavor you want to it, like orange, peach, lime, grape, strawberry, raspberry, cherry, vanilla. Right.
So instead so, of instead of uh, there, like there's no vanilla Coke, you just get a Coke and then add vanilla. Wow. The idea of like a strawberry diet Coke or cherry a cherry diet Coke already exists, but there's <laughs> yeah, it's, it's pretty great. awesome. It's amazing. Like, like I'm gonna go to a restaurant that has one of these only because I did a search <laughs> to find one on the thing so I could go use it. Right. So they're genius. Yeah. Uh, okay. So these are restaurant dispensing devices. Yeah. Well. Yeah, so like, it's a. Yeah. It's a. It's so a. Funny. SF General Hospital cafeteria. Because you go to Coca Cola, <laughs> Coca Dash Cola Freestyle dot com, and you can. Yep. Punch yeah. in your zip code. Oh, Wingstop, Fuddruckers, Denny's. See, there's tons of them out there. There's not as many out here in Cincinnati yet, but uh, we're working on it. I'm gonna see if I. I wonder how much it would cost to get one in the office. <laughs> uh, it's basically the syrup contract, dude. They usually, it's, they so, usually, yeah. so they're doing a really interesting thing with the syrup stuff. Um, it's it's in these little canisters that look an awful lot like inkjet uh, cartridges, um, and huh. that's and that's how they dis- and at least the flavors do. I don't know if the syrups do. Yeah, but yeah. syrups come in bulk boxes. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I don't think it makes sense for them to go to move away from like the massive kind of infrastructure they built around those things. Um, yeah. <laughs> I don't think I want to sign a syrup contract. I guess I'll not get one of those. Well, you might find out it's a lot cheaper than canned. Um, you know, there's, 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 you know, call it's got to cost computer. a lot. Like I imagine that everybody wants one of these um, and that they just can't make them fast enough type of thing. They are profoundly know? slick looking. Yeah. Wow. All right. Let me, I'll do uh, an ad read. We need a title. Look at that. High tech burrito. High tech burrito. This is San Rafael, though. That's the next uh, town over. We have a high tech yeah. burrito in Petaluma, but yeah, yeah that's what I thought. Okay, I know. I was. I got excited there for a second, and then I realized. <laughs> Wait a minute. I think I may have had pictures of the inside of the Coca Cola freestyle machine. Oh. Yes. One hundred. My son. Do that research. Somebody try to find out how how I go about ordering one. Well, it, on the uh, on the Google uh, thing, uh, the the next uh, is cost. Oh, on the okay. What's the what's the Yahoo how much answer? Does a hundred cost? Oh, two thousand dollars. That's easy. What? What? It's a tax write off, dude. <laughs> We're getting <laughs> one for Twit. We are so getting one for Twit. That's awesome. And by that, remember, I mean I hope all of that the time you save when you prevent your employees from leaving. PCPer.com office. I was going to get a mini fridge. Screw that. <laughs> well, we buy so much Coke. Yeah. <laughs> is it really that big? Yeah, it's it's large, and that yeah. that screen is a touch screen. So, uh, yeah. so you're gonna you. Uh, what's funny is I, I watched a thing on this when they were oh, first wow. making them, and they said that that they had to redesign the hopper, the that uh, collects the excess you know fluids at the bottom because people yeah, people would take a taste of whichever one they wanted and then they'd pour it out. And, uh, uh yeah. And so they, uh, they had to redesign the whole hopper to, to accept more because people oh, were pouring it out in the thing. This is crazy. They, they actually have, they are moving away from the, so basically if you've never worked in a restaurant, soda syrup comes in a five gallon bag. They have these boxes yeah, and boxes box. of soda syrup. So yeah. they've, they've turned, they've turned the five gallon, they've, basically gone for ultra concentrated flavor so it's now a 46 ounce cartridge uh is equals a five gallon bag worth of of flavoring quote but from this this uh uh this fast company article um the cartridges also track exactly what's being dispensed in real time so they got so they got rid of the uh so it is an inkjet thing yeah oh wow wow yeah and and you guys get one of those at twit i'll move up there I'll do that show up there. <laughs> that provides a continuous data stream to Coke about what's catching the consumer's fancy. So you could, for example, track how a new product performs down to the ounce shortly after its introduction. Wow. Use Coke hat, with lime. out in the chat room. The closest exist. one to me. Thank you. La Rosa's Pizza Newport. <laughs> 22 point six miles. <laughs> You're going to drive 22 miles to try one of these? To get a Why Diet not? Coke with cherry or raspberry flavor in it or something. Yeah. I can't believe there's not a single picture of the inside of this machine. Oh, wait. I found pictures of the cartridges. I'm sure oh. I'm sure that they have them. One second. Let's find it. This is awesome. There's like, they do Sorry like a double cartridge I for... Didn't it. Uh, I didn't mean to totally derail everything at, at Twit. 
We're getting one of these. Oh, man, I want one so bad. They have like a double cartridge. I don't think that video in the middle is about Coke. <laughs> Can we get one from the studio? I want one so badly. It does have caffeine-free diet. Caffeine-free, Dave. You mean the brown water? <laughs> yeah, that's what I drink. I drink brown water. <laughs> <laughs> I admire. Actually, I I just... Wow. That's just... I'm Gotta really tripping one. out on this. Gotta have one. You know, and I know where there, there's one actually very close to me on the way home. Oh. Ask Perhaps I should report and investigate. The problem is it means going into a Fuddruckers. Yeah, it's worth the sacrifice. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Let me let me do that. Let me let's you do the ads. The though. last Fuddruckers experience I had. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <clears throat> all right. Uh, where is that? Here we go. See, now I feel like the title of the episode should be like Freestyle Coca Cola, but we didn't talk about that on the show. Three, two. Here's the inside. Um. So there he goes. That's what the inside looks like. It's just like an inkjet printer. See, those kids love it. I love my Coke Freestyle. <laughs> you can't be mocking it because you just spent like nine minutes. I know. I know. <laughs> broadcast, dude. I know. Well, this is CNBC talking about the Coke Freestyle. <laughs> yeah, this is news. Coke Freestyle. People love it. 